For generations, we have been told a story of human evolution that is tidy, linear, and reassuringly simple. It's a story with clear chapters, a small-brained ape-like creature, then the upright walker, then the toolmaker, then the intellectual giant that is us. In this version of history, the journey from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens is a smooth, continuous line, a march of progress where each successive species is simply a better, smarter, and more modern version of the last. It's a comforting narrative, but it is also a fundamental misunderstanding of the true history of our kind. The scientific reality is far more complex, far messier, and infinitely more fascinating. This brings us to the central mystery of the Middle Pleistocene, a period in human evolution so confusing that paleoanthropologists have affectionately dubbed it the muddle in the middle. This is the era from roughly 700,000 to 200,000 years ago, when our family tree was not a neat line, but a tangled bush full of diverging branches and regional experiments. And at the heart of this muddle, standing tall and casting a long shadow, is the figure of Homo heidelbergensis. For a long time, this species was seen as a simple transitional form, a missing link between Homo erectus and the Neanderthals and us. The scientific reality, however, is that this wasn't a humble stepping stone. This was a unique, powerful and wildly successful species in its own right, a veritable titan of the human lineage. And the evidence, buried in the sand pits of Germany and the caves of Spain, is revealing a creature that defies our tidy narratives. This was a hominin that didn't just survive in the harsh, unpredictable world of the Ice Age. It dominated it. But was it truly the most formidable species in all of human history? The true giant of the Homo genus? To answer that, we must redefine what we mean by giant, and let the fossils themselves tell the story. The investigation begins now. First, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button to make sure you don't miss our next deep dive into the mysteries of human evolution. The case for Homo heidelbergensis as a giant is not a hypothesis built on a single find. It is a story told by an entire fossil record from isolated bones to entire populations. And this story begins with the very first bone that gave the species its name. The discovery came in 1907 in a sandpit near Mauer, Germany. A workman unearthed a jawbone so massive and so primitive looking that its discoverer, Otto Schotensack, knew immediately it was something entirely new. This fossil, known as the Mauer I mandible, became the holotype, the single specimen by which the entire species would be defined. The simple explanation, often cited in older textbooks, is that this was just a primitive jaw from an early human. The scientific reality is that the Mauer mandible is a powerful statement about the entire body it supported. Schotensack himself noted the tremendous overall size of the bone, observing a striking disproportion. The jaw itself was massive, while the teeth within it were surprisingly small and human-like. This mandible is defined by its brutal strength, it possesses a remarkably thick body and an incredibly broad ascending ramus, the vertical part of the jaw where the powerful chewing muscles, the masseters, attach. The bone's sheer construction implies an immense capacity for generating bite force, suggesting a lifestyle that placed enormous mechanical stress on the entire craniofacial structure. It tells a story of a head and, by extension, a body built for raw, brute power. From this single, powerful piece of evidence, our investigation now turns to the rest of the body, the postcranial skeleton. Our next clue takes us to Boxgrove, in southern England, where a partial shin bone was unearthed. The simple explanation is that this belonged to a tall individual. The scientific reality is that this one bone provides a stunning level of detail about the physical adaptations of Homo heidelbergensis. The discovery came in the form of a partial left tibia, dated to about 480,000 years ago. The biggest breakthrough came not just from measuring its length, but from analyzing its structural integrity. The bone belonged to a mature male with an estimated stature between 177 and 182 semisim, or about 510 to 6 nero. This is a significant height, but the key finding was the bone's exceptional structural strength. By using a technique called cortical thickness analysis, 
which measures the density and thickness of the bone's outer layer, scientists were able to deduce the forces and stresses that this individual's body endured. The conclusion was undeniable. The thickness of the bone's shaft was far greater than what we see in modern humans, pointing to a body adapted for high levels of physical activity and heavy biomechanical loading. This was the tibia of a predator, adapted for a life of chasing and tackling large game in a challenging environment. But what about the rest of the body? Our next major piece of evidence takes us to a deep limestone cave in the Atapuerca Mountains of Spain, a site known as Cima de los Huesos, or the Pit of Bones. This is where the simple explanation, relying on a single fossil to tell the whole story, falls apart. The scientific reality is that Cima de los Huesos gives us something unprecedented. Not a single individual, but an entire population of Homo heidelbergensis. Over 7,000 fossils, representing at least 28 individuals, all dated to around 430,000 years ago, were recovered from this single chamber. This is the largest collection of Middle Pleistocene human fossils in the world, a unique window into the life of an entire community. By reconstructing the individuals from this incredible sample, the story of their immense size becomes undeniable. First, stature. The incredible sample of 27 complete limb bones allowed for precise reconstructions. The average height of males in this population was around 169.56 cm, or 5.7, and females averaged 157.7 cm, or 5.2. While this may not sound like a giant, what is crucial is that this makes them, on average, slightly taller than their Neanderthal descendants. Second, body mass and build. This is where the Cima de los Huesos hominins truly set themselves apart. This population possessed wide, heavy skeletons indicative of substantial muscle mass. To determine this, researchers used methods that correlate bone density and size to estimated body weight. The conclusions were astonishing. Their skeletons were an estimated 36% heavier than those of modern humans. Their body plan was fundamentally broad and robust, and pooled sex body mass estimates averaged around 70 kilos or 154 pound lambs. But the site reveals the true upper limits of the species' size. The most complete male pelvis ever found from this period, nicknamed Elvis, belong to an individual whose weight is estimated to have been a staggering 90 to 100 kilos, or 109 to 220 arms. This is one of the highest body mass estimates for any archaic human, and demonstrates that the Cima de los Huesos population, and by extension Homo heidelbergensis as a whole, could achieve a scale of massiveness rarely, if ever, seen elsewhere in the human lineage. The story doesn't end in Europe. The evidence for this giant body plan is consistent across continents. In Africa, the Kabwe-1 skull, found in Zambia, tells a similar tale. The simple explanation is that this is another large cranium with an impressive brow ridge. The scientific reality is that associated post-cranial remains allow us to reconstruct a body of truly imposing scale. Reconstructions from a tibia and a femur fragment estimate the Kabwe individual stood between 179 and 184 centimeter tall, or about 5 yen tens to 6 zero, with a body mass between 63 and 81 kilo. These figures place the African members of this group squarely in the same tall and robust category as their European counterparts. The consistency of this large body plan across vast distances is a powerful argument that this was a core defining feature of the species, not just a localized adaptation. Now a word of caution. You may have heard a sensational claim often attributed to paleoanthropologist Lee R. R. Berger that some populations of H. heidelbergensis were giants routinely over 2.13 meters or 7 feet tall. This is a tantalizing idea, but it's crucial to understand how science works. The biggest breakthrough on this front will not come from a sensational statement on a secondary source, but from a peer-reviewed scientific paper that presents and analyzes the physical evidence for this claim. Until that paper is published and the evidence vetted, this assertion must be treated as an unsubstantiated but provocative hypothesis. 
the confirmed evidence we have from Cima de los Huesos, Boxgrove, and Cabway is already more than sufficient to establish H. heidelbergensis at the extreme upper end of the known hominin size range. To truly understand the place of Homo heidelbergensis in our family tree, we must move beyond simply examining its fossils in isolation. We must place it in the context of its evolutionary relatives and see how it stacks up against its ancestors and its descendants. The simple explanation is that human evolution was a steady progression in size. The scientific reality is that body size was a dynamic, branching and adaptive trait that shifted in response to the environment. Let's begin with a comparison to its ancestor, Homo erectus. In its earlier African form, often called Homo ergaster, this species was the first to disperse widely out of Africa. Its body plan was a marvel of adaptation. Tall, slender, with long legs and shorter arms, a runner's physique, perfectly suited for stamina and efficient cooling in the hot, arid environments of the savannah. While some Homo erectus individuals could be quite tall, Reaching up to 185 centimeters, their overall build was far more gracile than that of Homo heidelbergensis. The emergence of our subject species marks a distinct evolutionary shift away from this lanky body plan towards a much more robust, heavily muscled form. The biggest breakthrough on this front came from a simple measurement of bone density. By using techniques that measure the thickness of the cortical bone in their limbs, Scientists were able to show that while their average height may have been similar to the taller Homo erectus individuals, Homo heidelbergensis was consistently and significantly more heavily built. The conclusion was that this was a species that traded the sheer endurance of its ancestor for a strategy based on power and strength. Next, let's compare Homo heidelbergensis to its immediate descendants, the Neanderthals. The relationship here is one of direct ancestry. The European populations of H. heidelbergensis gradually evolved into the classic Neanderthal form. But the story of this evolution is not one of a simple size increase. The scientific reality is that this was a process of specialization. On average, Homo heidelbergensis was slightly taller than the Neanderthals. But the Neanderthals were more massive for their height, possessing an incredibly stocky and powerful build with a broad barrel-shaped chest and characteristically short forearms and shins. The biggest breakthrough on this front came from a better understanding of climate adaptations. We now understand that this unique physique is a textbook example of an adaptation to the frigid climates of Ice Age Europe, where a lower surface area to volume ratio helps to minimize heat loss. The conclusion is that while both species were giants in their own right, their gigantism was expressed differently. Homo heidelbergensis was a tall, broadly built giant. The Neanderthal was a shorter, wider, hypermuscular one, a true powerhouse of the cold. Finally, we must turn to ourselves, Homo sapiens. The evolutionary path from the African populations of H. heidelbergensis to us involved a marked trend toward what we call gracilization a reduction in skeletal robusticity. Early Homo sapiens evolved a body plan characterized by a more slender trunk, lighter bones, and relatively long limbs. This physique, often called lanky, is an adaptation to the tropical climates of Africa, where a higher surface area to volume ratio facilitates more efficient cooling. The simple explanation is that we are simply the more advanced version. The scientific reality, however, is that while the earliest modern humans to enter Europe were notably tall, their overall build was fundamentally different. A 175 Simosimia Homo sapiens male would have been significantly lighter and less powerfully built than a H. heidelbergensis male of the same height. The latter's massive face, heavy boned skeleton and wider frame would have made it a far more imposing figure. The conclusion is that the evolutionary path from H. heidelbergensis to ourselves was one of trading brute strength for athletic efficiency. Our success wasn't predicated on raw physical power, but on a more energy-efficient body combined with increasingly sophisticated technology and social behaviors. The story of our own lineage is a story of moving away from the physical might that defined our giant ancestor. Now, before we move on to our final verdict, what do you think? 
Do you believe the evidence points to Homo heidelbergensis as the most formidable of our ancestors? Or do you think the title of giant belongs to another species? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Our journey through the fossil record is now complete. The cumulative evidence from the Mauer mandible in Germany to the population of robust individuals in Cima de los Huesos and the tall, powerful remains from Cabwe in Zambia all converge on a single, inescapable conclusion. This was a species that was consistently and exceptionally large-bodied across its vast geographic range. But was it the true giant of the Homo genus? Our answer requires us to revisit our three-dimensional framework. On the measure of stature, the verdict is no. While individuals from Boxgrove and Cabway were tall, some populations of its ancestor, H. erectus, and its descendant, early H. sapiens, achieved comparable heights. It was among the tallest, but it does not hold the title exclusively. However, on the measures of body mass and robusticity, the verdict is an emphatic yes. This is where the case for Homo heidelbergensis as a giant becomes most compelling. While Neanderthals were also extremely massive and robust, Homo heidelbergensis combined great height with exceptional body width and skeletal thickness, resulting in a body plan of unparalleled overall scale. The evidence from Cima de los Huesos, with male individuals estimated to weigh up to 100 kilos or 220 pounds, demonstrates a potential for massiveness that likely surpassed that of any other Homo species. When compared to the relatively gracile builds of both H. erectus and H. sapiens, H. heidelbergensis exists in a different category of sheer power and mass. The conclusion is undeniable. The title True Giant of the Homo genus is a fitting and defensible characterization for Homo heidelbergensis. It was the apex of a biological strategy founded on size and strength. It was a titan perfectly adapted to the formidable challenges of the middle Pleistocene world, a hunter of mammoths and rhinoceroses whose success was predicated on physical power and resilience. But the story of this giant is also a crucial preface to our own. The evolutionary path away from this immense physical power marks one of the most significant transitions in human history. The decline in raw physical power from H. heidelbergensis to H. sapiens is a story of a fundamental shift from solving problems with biological hardware to solving them with cultural and technological software. Homo heidelbergensis confronted its world with the crushing force of its body and jaw. We, with a lighter frame, would ultimately conquer that same world through superior projectile technology, more complex social networks and symbolic thought. The giant's reign represents the zenith of a physical strategy that was powerful and successful, but ultimately less flexible than the cognitive and cultural path that our own lineage would follow. The giant fell, not because it was weak, but because a new, more adaptable kind of human was rising. 